Okay, um, so welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Devlin. I'm gonna be your host this evening and uh, Narrative Medicine Rounds uh, on behalf of the Division of Narrative Medicine at Columbia here. Uh, and I welcome those of you particularly who are joining Narrative Medicine Rounds uh, for the first time. And uh, we hope that it won't be the last. And we welcome back all returning attendees. Uh, just to give you a little history, Narrative Medicine rose at Columbia in 2001 and is now an international movement at the intersection of humanities, the arts, clinical practice and healthcare justice. Uh, narrative training equips us clinicians to humbly try to comprehend patients' experiences and perspectives uh, in order to deliver equitable and effective care. Uh, rigorous training and practice of narrative medicine helps all those interested in person-centered, respectful healthcare to deepen self-awareness, clinical attunement, collaborative skills, creative capacities, uh, and our commitments to healthcare justice underlie our writing, teaching, research, advocacy, and delivery of care. Uh, the narrative medicine community assembles monthly at rounds to grow our knowledge, partnership, and commitment to a just and effective healthcare future. Um, and uh, I think that was never more true than tonight with Donald Antrim. Before we start, uh, I just wanna go through quickly a few of the ground rules. Um, so please keep your microphone muted, um, although I maybe followed that one a little too, too, too closely. Um, be forewarned that if there are disruptions, you know, we will, I, we don't anticipate that, but um, we have our narrative medicine staff standing by to um, remove people if things become uh, inappropriate in any way. Uh, we're going to lock the meeting in a, in a few minutes for security reasons. If you leave or your connection is broken, you're not going to be able to get back in. Um, but there is going to be a recording and that will be available in a couple of days. Uh, if we have a Zoom intrusion, uh, we need to end the meeting, uh, we will terminate it. Uh, and then you're going to get a link to come back in. So even that will not keep us from moving forward. It'll just be a disruption. Um, we will ask you during the talk to keep your chat uh, interactions to a minimum. When we start um, the, uh, the conversation part, you can feel free to put uh, questions that you might have uh, into the chat. Um, and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. The event is being recorded. Everybody's gonna get the link in a couple of days. Uh, and importantly, at the end, we're gonna have a link to an online bookstore to order books or find out more information about our speaker and about medical humanities. So let me, uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, our speaker for tonight, Donald Antrim. Uh, Donald Antrim is the author of three novels including Elect Mr. Robinson for a Better World and a memoir, The Afterlife, which is wonderful, uh, and a regular contributor to The New Yorker. You probably read his contributions to The New Yorker. Um, he's the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant uh, and fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, the Dorothy and Louis B. Coleman Center at the New York Public Library. He lives in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and I just wanted to add a, a kind of a personal note that it was as wonderful as one Friday in April, I think would, it is and, and would have been in any case, it was a, a kind of particularly exciting for me to read it as somebody who has worked at Columbia and worked at New York State Psychiatric Institute and, and walked those halls and seen, and seen those things that are being described. It was, to, and, you know, and on top of that to really get what I think is a, some really new ideas and new perspectives um, on suicide, and even kind of some new thoughts about what suicide even is and what it is and what it means. Um, so we're so lucky to have uh, Donald Antrim. The way uh, the evening will work is that um, Donald's gonna read for uh, about 15 minutes. Then we get to have a conversation for uh, 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll take some questions at the end. Right. Um, thank you, Donald. Great, should I just read now? I, th I think so, um, if you're ready. I'll start with this and then we'll talk. Okay. These are the opening pages of One Friday in April. One Friday in April, 2006, I spent the afternoon and evening pacing the roof of my apartment building in Brooklyn, climbing down the fire escape ladder and hanging by my hands from the railing then climbing back up with sore palms and lying on the roof in a ball or stretched out on my back or on my stomach, maybe peering surreptitiously over the roof ledge. The roof is painted silver. The building is four stories tall. 
a group of my friends, each of whom had been on the phone with me, one, one after the other, all through the morning, when I'd been alone and dialing wildly, had got busy calling each other. Janice owned a car, and she and Nikki were coming across the bridge from Manhattan, but there was traffic, and no one knew where I was. From the roof, the world seemed to scream. I heard sirens, police, ambulance, and fire. What agency would come for me? A helicopter was flying overhead and circling back. The woman I'd just run from, the woman who had rushed over ahead of the others, who had been with me downstairs in my apartment, my partner then, Reagan, thought that I'd gone to the street. We had been fighting over something I'd done. I'd hurt her, and we were both in anguish. She spoke harshly, and I ran away to die and end her burden. She charged after me, but the wrong way, down instead of up out the front door of the building and toward the avenue. The sun was setting and the sky over New Jersey was orange and I was in my socks, shivering. I was afraid for my life. I didn't know why I had to fall from the roof, why that was mine to do. When telling the story of my illness, I try not to speak about depression. I prefer to call it suicide. The American novelist William Styron, in his memoir, Darkness Visible, a memoir of madness, argues that the word depression is inadequate to describe this illness, and I agree. A depression is a concavity, a sloping downward and a return. Suicide, in my experience, is not that. I believe that suicide is a natural history, a disease process, not an act or a choice, a decision or a wish. I do not understand suicide as a response to pain or as a message to the living, or not only as those things. I do not think of suicide as the act, the death, the fall from a height or the trigger pulled. I see it as a long illness, an illness with origins in trauma and isolation in deprivation of touch in violence and neglect in the loss of home and belonging. It is a disease of the body and the brain if you make that distinction but its etiology, its beginnings, whether in early or later life, in the family or beyond, are social in nature. I see suicide as a social disease. I will refer to suicide, not depression. My sickness lasted years. It continued after that Friday on the roof and went on for more than a decade through long hospitalizations and more than 50 rounds of electroconvulsive therapy, once known as shock therapy, it lasted through a decade of recovery, relapse, and recovery. Those times seem far removed, though they can also feel recent in memory. Up on the roof, I felt as if I had been dying all my life. I felt that it had begun when I was a little child. I was hanging from the fire escape. I kept a toehold. The sun was low, the air was cold. I was wearing socks, but no shoes and my palms were scraped and beginning to blister from letting go a little, one hand at a time, falling out at an angle, sideways or backward, then grabbing fast for the rail and clutching tight. I gazed down at the concrete patio and the chain link fence surrounding the backyard. The yard was inaccessible, small and neglected. My apartment is on the third floor and windows in my kitchen and bedroom overlook it, though you'd have to stick your head out to see much. I never looked at the yard for more than a minute or heard anyone in it. Below me was the small patio area littered with trash and an outdoor stairwell leading to the locked basement and the boiler. The rest was hard ground. Since that time, since 2006, new people, a family, have moved into the first floor apartment and they've replaced the old chain link fence with one made of wood and put, and put in a barbecue and a picnic table I can hear their children when it's warm out, along with on school days, even in the cold winter months, older children, neighborhood kids playing and screaming on the rooftop playground of the private school a few doors down the street. Recess was over, school was out, night was falling. I had no children. I held onto the railing. It was less dizzying to look down than up. Clouds blew across the sky. Here and there, I could see people have, leaving, having after work cocktails on private decks on neighboring roofs. It was the beginning of a spring weekend. 
Now, remembering that day, I wonder what those people might have thought of the man scrambling from fire escape to rooftop and back, letting go with one hand, flopping down on his belly to crane over the ledge. Did they imagine that he was doing work, maintenance or repair, some job they couldn't clearly make out? If they had known the man's troubles, had known the man, would they have understood that he was about to die? Or would they have imagined that he was trying to live? It was getting darker and I could hear traffic on the street below, people driving home through Brooklyn after work. I was cold. I'd been up there a long time. I didn't know that it had been five hours. It could have been any amount of time. I had on pants, a shirt and socks. My hands and clothes were dirty from the rooftop. My pants fit loosely and were falling down. I'd become thin over the winter. Where was my belt? I shoved my hands in my pockets and squeezed my arms up onto my sides, trying to get warm. I'd written about my mother, her alcoholic life and her resignation and death and my role as her son, savior, and abandoner. I began writing the year after she died, too soon for writing to be safe. The book was an accounting of the death of my family. Writing the book had been an excitement, but publishing was an ordeal. The book was a movement from exposition to scene, defense to acceptance, mortification to love. But my old worlds, Charlottesville, Gainesville, Miami, Sarasota, all the places of my childhood were costly to rebuild. I worked at betrayal, mine of my mother, hers of me, mine of myself. I was born in Sarasota, Florida on a September night in 1958. In the story that my mother tells of my birth, I was taken from her by force. Her mother, my grandmother, pulled me out of my mother's arms and kept me. My mother was not allowed to hold me. My father, who had graduated from college the summer before on an ROTC scholarship was away, training to command tanks at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where 11 months later, my sister Terry would be born. My mother told me that she and I were distraught. I cried and cried, but her mother would not give me back. There was panic, she told me, and more fighting and crying, and it took my father a day and a night to get there. Where was my grandfather? I knew my mother's father as a docile, suffering man. When I was very little, he'd fallen off the roof of the house while replacing tiles and broken his back. The house was a two-story white stucco bungalow with a red tile roof, Venetian blinds on the windows, a mowed lawn, a paved driveway, and a carport, a front door that wasn't used, a guest bedroom downstairs, and three bed bedrooms upstairs. My sister and I lived with our grandparents when our parents were divorcing for the first time. Terry was five and I was six. We lay awake in separate bedrooms in the heat, fans blew. Downstairs, a sun porch with orchids and potted shrubs faced a little square yard planted with orange and tangerine trees. There was wisteria and hibiscus. The air was wet and sticky. Down a little walkway out back was the two-story garage where my grandfather spent part of each day, where he had tools hung hanging on a pegboard stacked paint cans, a work table with a vice, and beer in an old refrigerator. The garage smelled of paint thinner, insecticide, and lawnmower gas. My grandfather sat at a bench and mended kitchen cabinet drawers or rewired appliances or sanded wood while sipping from a can. He chewed cinnamon chewing gum and toothpicks. My mother was subjected to Munchausen syndrome by proxy also known as factitious disorder imposed on another, a form of abuse that is carried out, usually by a parent or caregiver as medical or surgical intervention. My mother recounted a succession of unnecessary operations, heart operations demanded by her mother and performed by compliant doctors. In one story she told, she was a teenager at Sarasota Memorial Hospital under anesthesia on the operating table, her chest cut open. She heard the doctors pronounce her dead she could not move or speak, but she could see them peering down at her. The long story of forced visits to doctors, of my grandmother's control of her daughter's body, the authoritarian cycle of manipulation, intimate violation, and symbolic repair was never understood in my family. 
and it implies, <clears throat> it implicates my grandmother and my grandfather together in collusion or complicity in crimes against their only child. They drank, my mother told me shortly before she died. She told me that her parents fought and were violent toward each other and that her mother had tried to drown her in a well when she was a baby. She told me that my grandfather was not her real father and that no one knew the truth about anything. I was in my socks on the fire escape. I was cold, underweight, and scratched up from the roof's rough surface, from crawling to the edge and leaning over to peer down. I imagined my body on the ground. It was something that I could picture, but the fall, how long would that last? Might I, during the seconds of falling, regret my own death? Would dying hurt? I'd had no intention of running to the roof. I'd run up the stairs without deciding, and I'd climbed onto the fire escape without deciding. The idea of letting go was terrifying. I did it again and again, though. It would have been easy to miss catching the railing. My motor control was failing. I held the railing, then let go a little, and then grabbed hold, and then caught, then let go again, but caught myself. I was not on the roof to jump. I was not there to die, but dying was not a plan. I was not making choices, threats, or mistakes. Is this what we mean by impulsive behavior? I was, I think, looking back now in acceptance. It was a relinquishing, though at the time I wouldn't, would not have been able to articulate that. I did not want to die, only felt that I would or should or must and I had my pain and my reasons, my certainties. If you have had this illness, then you've had your reasons and maybe you believed or still believe as I have, that it would be better for everyone, for all the people <clears throat> who have made the mistake of loving you or who one day might, if you were gone. Stop there. Thank you. Well. Thank you for, for choosing that uh, segment to read. Um, I, I guess, well, first of what I wanted to say is that I, this is um, billed as a conversation. So please, um, if, if I've got some questions, but if you have questions for me, uh, fire away. Um, but, but I'll start with a question. Um, that, and it's, it has to do with exactly what you write, which is that opening incredibly harrowing, hair-raising image of dangling from the fire escape and you know letting go and grabbing back on and back on the roof and back on the fire escape and the cans all scraped up um is so powerful and it, you know it while one might initially or i initially thought of that as you donald trying to die by the end of the book i thought no that's you donald trying to live mm -hmm. um and i feel like that image just hung over the whole book and guided the whole book. And my, my question for you is kind of as a writer, I, I had also read the New Yorker uh, article, which mentioned that scene, but not with that all that kind of prominence. Like, how did you know that that was the way to open this book? How did, how did you do that? I began it this way without really knowing. And I, and I wrote about seven pages. And, uh, and then I blew up. Uh, I didn't really know. What happened was I, I at that point I at that point I I began feeding in critical references to Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, which I read as a suicide narrative. And I think at the time that I had an idea that my story alone wouldn't be enough, but if I could find a more an, an historical example in in art, then I might be able to write a kind of parallel story. Hmm my life and the creature's life that the creature goes through intense deprivation and loneliness mm -hmm. so and 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 expounds on it in you know in highly articulate ways and suicide had been a big uh, problem in mary shelley's life but it didn't really work out it was it was a mess and i worked at that for a number of years trying to make that work going through Frankenstein, going through literary sources. And it wound up being just confusing. So after a few years with the help of my editor at the New Yorker, I wound up cutting it back to those first seven pages. And at that point, after all the struggle 
to reconcile this other manuscript. I understood that it was exactly right to simply stick with my story and that it should run at a fast pace and that it should be fairly short. Um, so once I had the scene on the roof, I was able to return to that when I needed to. So, so there were, there was a way in which that did anchor the book. It really, it really, it, it really did anchor the book or does anchor the book. Mm -hmm. but it anchored me as well. So, <laughs> so that's how I knew. I knew because it felt right finally. And then when I continued from there, it was only another year or so before the book was written. So, so, so lots of thinking, lots of planning, lots of sitting around thinking, lots of preparing. Uh, I waited a long time to do this. I waited past a year, I waited about eight, nine years to begin writing. But the thing had been consuming to me for all those years. If, if you had known me during those years and you'd seen me on the street, I would have collared you. I would have just gone to you and I would have just said, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And I would have posed some problem about suicide. And that's what I did. I just was everywhere I went. And it was the one thing that mattered to me was this book. So. Oh, well, thank you. That, um, in a way that, that brings me to another uh, question that you blew my mind a little bit with the Frankenstein thing. I, um, that's, that, it, it, in a, in a, I mean, that's, um, that's amazing. And now like, I feel like I've got to go back to Frankenstein, but I, I, have read it a couple of times, and I think that's it's really apt um, as a suicide story. But but in the way that you think about suicide, and you part of what you read spoke to that. Um, but I feel like that you know what came through for this book is suicide is not best seen as an act, de definitely not a choice, but an ongoing kind of state. I, you use the word the phrase death in place um, later mm -hmm. on in the book. Um, and I, I wonder if there's just more to say about kind of what suicide is and isn't. And maybe if we as um, doctors, clinicians, social workers, mental health professionals understood that, um, what, what would we do? What, how could we be better? How could we, um, I don't know, how could, how could we be more therapeutic? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know how this, this idea, uh, I don't, I don't really know the medical utility of this idea. Um, it may, it may be that it would, in changing a perception of suicide, it may be that communication would be different between doctors and patients. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just the basic dialogue, what's being talked about here. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see suicide as a reaction to pain. Uh, I see it as a as a as a compliment, as it were, to pain. Um, I don't see suicide as a as a necessarily as the outcome of a plan. Um, I had plans of various kinds, but it's it's hard to know how to answer the question. Um, would it provide relief to patients to, 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 to understand that if they got better that the suicidality would go away because I don't think that, that that's something that I think that that I didn't understand when I was in the hospital I thought that I was stuck with that for life wow. um, what do you think would that would, would a different kind of communication or a different idea would it help would it help doctors I, I mean, I think to to be more deeply understood is all, you know, always helps everybody, you know. Um, so yeah, um, and and that last thing that you said about that, you know, that to to understand um, that suicide is not over, you know, in a person's mind when, once they're like pulled off of the roof and put in the hospital, like that's just right. the beginning, right? That right. seems really important. Yeah. Um, like the suicide is still there, it's still, and I, and I think I, I, I absolutely a thousand times um, support your idea of like depression just does not 
come anywhere near. I mean, I have not myself been depressed, but from people I've worked with, I don't think the word depression comes anywhere near capturing what this is. Um, the de death in life uh, was pretty compelling. I don't know if there are other phrases that have come to you for how to how to convey uh, what this is. I debated calling it that, um, but I didn't because it seemed to me that it would be distracting, possibly, if I use that all the way through the book. Um, but in retrospect, I, I was very suicidal at the end, when I was at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. And it went on until I had ECT and, yeah. and, and through ECT. Um, I don't know. I mean, can you say a little more about other other phrases? Do you think of anything? Yeah. Uh, I don't, uh, well, you know what? What's interesting to me about um, suicide uh, is that it, uh, I think the word sort of implies like self killing, the self right. turning on the self. Right. Um, so that's, that's important. And I think some of what you described was that, you know, to, to, mm -hmm. to be telling yourself some of the things that you told yourself, you'd be better off dead, you know, that, that those sorts of things are, and that that's really maybe central to it. And that that even if you're not hanging off the fire escape, that could still be, that could still be going on. Maybe people who never end up hanging off the fire, dangling from the fire escape, are are still in that state. Um, yeah. yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't. I mean, death and life. I, I I was tempted to try to sort of name it all as a new thing, uh, but I didn't do that. I I felt a little out of school doing that. Yeah. Yeah, you're not. I mean, I think you, you know, your uh, your lived experience and your uh, capacity for expression, um, like that, qualifies you. <laughs> in my view, to me. <laughs> like, you need you need to be talking with us about this. Yeah, uh, it began. the The book began for me during that first hospitalization at the institute. I had a lot of time. I was there for a very really? long time. Wow. wow! I was there for two months. No, I was there for almost four months. We did a drug trial for eight weeks. Right, nortriptyline, right? Did nortriptyline. Not yeah. I sat there for eight weeks doing nortriptyline, and it didn't ever really take hold. And then <clears throat> the doctors recommended ECT, and I've was terrified of it. I've written about that later on in the book. But during those months before ECT and during ECT, and I did have a certain amount of time, and I and I and it occurred to me to to wonder why so many writers on depression and suicide write metaphorically and write with images or write imagery instead of a more straightforward physical description, just a description of what kind of pain is happening where, what's happening in your chest, what's happening, mm -hmm. you know, here, there, in your stomach, how it feels, what it what it feels like, is what I wanted to try to do. And you did, yeah. Yeah, and so that began there. And it began, it began when one day I got up to walk across the 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 common room that we were in. And uh, I felt I felt this prickly burning sensation on, on, on my arms, which were like this. Yeah. And it seemed to me that, that it, the pain in my body had got so bad that even just a slight little bit of breeze from walking down the hall and across the room could cause this. And that was when I really began to wonder why we think of everything being in your head in this disease, when in fact, yeah. We're very, very sick. I, I got sicker and sicker. I believe that I had different sorts of illnesses. I believe that I had rheumatological disorders, facial disfigurements, which I could see in the mirror finally. Mm -hmm. I was quite psychotic, mm -hmm. you know. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, not something that can be understood. I mean, I think that whole mind-body distinction is problematic anyway, but particularly in this context. Yeah. Let me ask another, uh, a, a different question, but again, about the writing. Um, at various points in the book, I don't think it was in this section that you read, you will turn to the reader and ask a bunch of questions and they're hard ones. Like, have you ever tried to die? Have you found how difficult it is? Your friends know the sound of your voice when you're not well and ask if you're all right. Do you say that it's a hard day? Are there friends to tell? And it goes on, Do you, you know, that to me, um, what it was very kind of, you know, like, gosh, those are, you're making me think those are hard questions. Um, and you even end the book in convert. It's, it kind of puts you in conversation with the reader and you end the book that way with, um, uh, with some, the, I think was it can, uh, can change the, uh, about changing, uh, do you think, and uh, were you to write and send that letter, do you think it could change the world? And what I wanted to ask you is, um, can you say more about this and maybe how it relates to what you were trying to do um, either in this book or as a writer in general? You mean say more about the direct address to the reader? The direct address to the reader, yeah. Those hard questions. Yeah. Um, in about 2016, I believe, a friend organized a kind of a meeting. It was a bit of a social occasion, but also a, a group of psychiatrists from in Boston, from McLean's and elsewhere. And the idea was to talk about creativity and depression. And I changed the course of that during the talk and the meeting said that I just wanted to talk about suicide. I just wanted to talk about suicide. And we did some. Uh, I asked the doctors if they knew, if they ever felt that they knew when it was time to get their patient into a, in, onto a ward, for instance. Mm -hmm. And there was some confusion about that. And then I mentioned that one of the things that I wanted to do in the book that I'd thought about doing was a kind of direct address to the reader. The idea being that somebody holding this book might need to be holding this book. And, mm -hmm. I, and I might be speaking directly to someone holding the book. And a couple of the doctors there thought that that was, would be important. That would be a good thing to do. So I kept that idea and it just happened as I wrote, you know, it, it just, it just sort of happened that there were points at which you could ask questions about the experience of being sick and ask, you know, different, different kinds of physical symptoms and behaviors that we get into when we're sick. And the idea too, I think, had to do with this idea that maybe is close to narrative medicine, that, 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 that one of the things that we could do to help with this situation is tell our own stories. Mm -hmm. uh, that if you're, even if you're sick, you've got a story to tell. Um, that was really the, the, the basic idea was to speak directly to somebody who, who might be holding the book, who might, who might really be in trouble, you know. I think it's, I think, uh, I mean, I guess you'll, you'll probably have no way of knowing unless those people happen to contact you, but um, <laughs> I bet it has already happened and um, will happen many times more. I think it's really a, a gift in that way. Thank you. Uh, let me ask another, I'll ask another question or two, but I also wanna encourage um, anybody in the audience who has questions to just, uh, I see there are a number of great um, quest, uh, great comments in the chat, but if, you, if people have questions, um, we'll have time for at least a few of them. Um, so another, another aspect that came through really clearly um, of uh, suicide or death in place is its social aspect. And I, I felt that your narrative was pervaded with, uh, with your friends, with your lovers, with your family, with memories, um, even in uh, the segment you read. Um, can you, and, you, and then you made this really interesting statement about suicide as a, as a social disease. And I, I wonder if you can say more about that. Abandonment and isolation. Um... <sighs> Uh, 
when we're sick, everyone's a little sick around us. You know, I mean, people talk about contagion with this disease. And I'm not really, I don't really mean contagion so much. I mean, I know, I, I think this came from me watching others try to take care of me when I was sick. Um, my, my partner Reagan was burned out and distress in complete distress and sleepless and angry. Family members, caretakers, friends, anyone who tries to take care of somebody who's actively suicidal becomes implicated in the whole exhaustion and fatigue and in the illness. So I had that in mind in some ways that this disease occurs in a social context. And it can especially occur when somebody's alone. You know, I, I was, I was getting into those years then I was in my late forties. So I was getting into those years when it's not uncommon for men who were single and alone to become suicidal or to die of suicide or it's yes. not common, but it's, but it's less uncommon. And so I felt that my illness had come about through years and years of trauma and the isolation or the sort of personal isolation, the psychological isolation, the emotional isolation that, that attends trauma, that follows it. So when I, when I wrote, when I wanted to, when I began to think of it as a social disease, then I, I just began to think of it as something that exists in a, in, in, in some kind of social matrix that, that, that has left an individual traumatized or isolated. Okay. That's basically how I began to see it, that it was had a social component. You know, the things that happen to us, the things that we lose, the people we lose. Yeah. Um, loss is especially in, important here. We see that again and again. Yes. Um, you know, so so in in my situation, I was just shell shocked as a kid. Yes. And that continued in my life. I was as a young man, I was a tr tremendously anxious, we could say depressed fellow, you know. I identified my history as the cause of my suicidal nature, as, as the cause of my, and I think that that's probably something that goes without saying, you yeah. know. Yeah. Pretty much. Well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, it. Um, I don't know if that's clear, but I, th I think so. And, I, and you know, the, like the history, your history, and then kind of the events of the, you know, of the moment right. overlapping. It seemed kind of um, like something that had built up over years and years and years. Yeah, you know, and it finally got to the point where I was worn down. Yeah, and I was. You know, I was worn down by my own life. Yeah, you know, so when I wrote the book about my mother, I I published it in about in 2006. I was already in the hospital when that when that came out. Yeah, but writing that book was the trigger. You know, I revealed and I exposed, and I felt that I'd betrayed her and betrayed myself, as I say in the book. Um. That was how I identified it from the from the very beginning was because all during the months when that when that book was set to come out, I got worse and worse and worse and worse until yeah. finally I was in the hospital and two months later the book actually came out. Yeah. But at least I was safe, you know. Yeah. I just want to say, like to me, it, the, that book, The Afterlife, was um, a loving portrait of of. Um, 
of a mom who, I mean, who, uh, you know, had had many struggles. Um, but I, I, I would have never seen it as a betrayal. But I mean, I guess maybe that's kind of the. That was just something that I felt. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I felt it worse because I was getting sick. Yeah, of course. So I felt myself to be a kind of a criminal in this way. Yeah. It's just for people in the audience. If you haven't read it, it's a, it's a beautiful book. I highly recommend it. I'm going to turn now. Uh, we have a question by um, Nellie Herman. Okay. Um, and so Nellie says, I wonder if you can speak a bit about the evolution of your writing over the years. I know you said that this project was dramatically different from the work that came before. How did the idea come to you to write something that might have a different aim from what your work aimed at before? And has the work of writing a book like this changed your ideas about writing in general, what it might be for, or what you might write in the future? Ooh. Well, my writing evolved through three novels written in the 1990s. They were all short, fairly funny books about male narrators who make a mess of their lives and of everybody else's. And I thought, back then at the at the close of the 90s and the early 2000s i thought that i would just keep doing that that i would keep writing 180 page funny novels that would stack up over time but then my mother died and immediately i was writing about her i never she was a mortifying character to me at that point and um Then we have the result that we have this. I wrote about her and wound up in New York State Psychiatric Institute. So that was a big change and, and, and hard to come back from. I still haven't written another novel. Uh, I published some stories and writing for me was, was a very personal, private kind of thing. It, I, I never had any sense that, that what I wrote would make changes in the world or make changes for people. When it came time for this book, when it came time finally to think about this book, I frankly felt an obligation. I felt like, like I could do something. Mm -hmm. I'm a writer. I could manage that part. I had access to print. I could manage that part. And therefore I had to do this. So it was a sense of obligation and a, and a, and a sense of privilege in writing this. It has changed my ideas about writing. It has changed the way I will proceed. Uh, for one thing, it's written in shorter declarative sentences, and I like that. So I'll probably do more of that, you know. But it's a first person confessional, really, in, in a lot of ways. And, and I've done that twice now which I never planned to do. And I'd like to have, I'd like to be able to do, to write fiction uh, with a similar kind of sense of purpose and mission. Mm. Um, wow. Though I will have to see if that happens. Um, but, it, but, but the writing, the arc goes from a kind of private to public in a way, you know, this is meant all the way through this is meant to have a to have a to resonate publicly mm -hmm. thanks. i don't know if that answers the question yep. thanks i think now you say yes <laughs> um let, let's give you another one from the chat uh uh oh um oh Here's one uh, from uh, an unidentified questioner. Uh, thank you for sharing your story. Were there any particular attributes of clinicians that invited you to feel safer, more understood, or more accepted? Attributes. Um, my doctors at the Institute, I thought were great. Uh, I didn't think that for a long time while I was psychotic. Uh, I thought that I should be in a different hospital uh, attending to my physical illnesses that I imagined having. I remember, I remember, I remember one doctor that the anesthesiologist in, in ECT 
who assured me that I would get better. And it was at a moment when I was able to believe that. And he assured me over and over that I would get better. And then he told me that he had had strong reservations about ECT, that, that, that it seemed to him that it, he didn't understand that it wasn't still the brutal treatment, the, the old, old style shock therapy. Mm -hmm. But he had been invited across the skywalk from Columbia to <clears throat> come and observe and watch and see if he really wanted to do it. And at that point, he'd been doing it for six or seven years. He said he saw people get better and he was, he was hooked. And he said, you'll get better, you'll get better. And he said, the doctors won't quit. And my feeling was, and nurses would say the same thing to me, that you would take walks in the halls with nurses and they would say, you're going to get better, the doctors won't quit, in so many words. And I had that feeling about my doctors eventually. I realized that they didn't quit. Um, they had a certain amount of authority, uh, a certain amount of curiosity, uh, a certain amount of patience, a lot of patience for patients on the ward. Kindness is probably the, is probably the, the, the most important attribute. Um, and, and, and I found that at the Institute. You know, I found that at Nine Garden North and the Institute. I would say that 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 confidence and kindness are probably the two most important attributes. So, um, just uh, to quickly um, piggyback on that one, the 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 anesthesiologist um, telling you that that this was going to help and you were going to get better reminded me of the. The phone call from David Foster Wallace. Um, right. Um, was he? Did Did you know him well, or just? No, I, I I didn't know him well. I'd met him a couple times. He was friends of friends. I'd never really spent much time with him. Um, he was a friend of a friend, and he called that day, or the day after the meeting, in which I wept and wept and wept while uh, the doctors told me that. ECT would be what was next up for me and that they needed my consent to do it. And I thought it would kill me. I thought it would destroy me. And I was afraid of everything, Yeah. you know? Uh, I couldn't have lived for a minute outside the doors of the ward, you know? So we had this, there was this meeting of me and doctors sitting in a semicircle and them telling me this is what we had to do now that they, they, they thought we can get you better this way. And I wept and wept and wept and went out in the hall and wept and either that day or the next day, David Foster Wallace called on the phone having got the number from a friend, a mutual friend. And he wanted to tell me that if the doctors offered ECT that I should take it and I should do it. This is an act of God yeah, you know, right. in a lot of ways, you know. So he stayed on the phone with me for a very long time, assuring me that it was safe and that it would be okay. Wow. And after that phone call, I was able to go to the doctors and say, I was able to go to my doctor and say, let's do it, let's start. And very soon after that, we did. And, it, and I got better. It took a while, yeah. it took a while. But yeah. Yeah. Well, we have time for another question or two. Um, Here's uh, one from um, Prachikana. Uh, what is your relationship with words, especially in the context of this work? Is it ever exhausting? Is it ever exhausting? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I bet it is. Yeah. It's completely exhausting. Yeah. It's exhilarating, but also exhausting. You know, I'm a slow writer as a rule. Very slow. So how long did it take you to write the, this? I guess it's hard to quantify. Well, if you if you if you count the two and a half or three years while I was trying to do it with Frankenstein, um, four four and a half years, and that does count in a way. You know, it's all got thrown away. But yeah. So from the time that I knew what I was doing or felt that I knew what I was doing, it only took about another year. But they were about three years of experimenting with this and that and throwing things out. So yeah, it's exhausting. 
it's really exhausting. I don't know why anybody would do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm so I'm very glad that you did. This book um, was exhilarating. This book was exhilarating to write. It was exciting to write. It, it didn't didn't cause me to feel more depressed or suicidal. It was it was really a privilege to write. Yeah, and um, cer certainly a privilege to read. And you know, definitely, I'm I'm sure everything that you've written has had um, an impact. But this has a particular kind of impact um, on a on a group of people who particularly need need that lifeline. Um, I think we are getting close to, uh, I'm not sure we have time for any more questions because um, it is 6.55. And so I think at this point, it's time for me to thank you so much mm -hmm. for coming and being with us and reading and having this conversation. Um, and uh, to thank everybody in the audience for uh, for coming to this. Um, and uh, links to where you can purchase One Friday in April, a story of suicide and survival should be shared on your screen in, in just a moment. Uh, and a recording of tonight's event is gonna be shared later this week via email to all who registered. And we hope to see you all in May when we welcome Emmy award-winning writer, cultural activist, uh, Kairat Irani. And, how, uh, and hear about how she utilizes theater of the oppressed to create art, to build community, and to connect audiences to social justice. I look forward to seeing you all then.